All right, we have our we have our official start there. Uh, we'll do a meditation on a meditation on a meditation today. The, the original painting by uh, uh, the Song of the Lark by Jules Breton, who was he was a nineteenth century uh, French uh, realist. He painted a lot of pastoral scenes. Uh, yeah, I just got to get this off the screen. Uh, and I'm going to put this, uh, I'm just going to share the picture again just for a minute. So in case you, you're just coming in and haven't seen it. There we go. Uh, uh, painted this scene in 1884. And a few years later, an uh, American named Henry Field uh, bought it, uh, American out of Chicago. And then it became one of the first uh, uh, piece of art in the uh, what became the Art Institute of Chicago, a great uh, art museum. It's actually, you can, you can see the live, you can see the, the, the real one there in the field uh, collection. Um, so I want to give you a little background on that before we go into, uh, that was sort of a meditation on, uh, on a lot of things in terms of uh, paint, uh, oil paint on canvas. And then uh, uh, David White, uh, Welsh American poet uh, uh, wrote a poem on it, which was a meditation on the on the uh, picture itself. And then uh, we're going to actually do our own meditation on the poem. So we're uh, going three levels deep on this thing. Uh, before I start, I want to uh, dedicate this teaching today. A couple uh, uh, recent graduates. Uh, um, they put the uh, day of a person's death on their cross. Thomas Merton, for instance, December 10th, 1968. Father Lewis Merton, as it's on there. So they consider when you die, you're graduating from the school of this life into some kind of a PhD program beyond. So they always talk about graduation. They talk about death in terms of graduation, not in terms of end of anything. It's like you're going on to the next level of uh, education. And uh, so I want to dedicate it, uh, to today's teaching to a couple of recent graduates. Uh, Jerry Lipke, uh, uh, a guy in uh, Pittsburgh, who's a, a relative of a dear friend of mine, just uh, passed away sort of suddenly. And then uh, Sister uh, Anna Marie Rhodes, who's a, a sister of Charity of Nazareth, a local group. I knew Sister Anna Marie. She's a sister of one of uh, my dear friends here who's actually on the broadcast today. So dedicated to both Jerry and Anna Marie. Uh, happy graduation. Okay, um, uh, the interesting thing about the, this picture is, uh, if, you can, if you can American imagine America at the turn of the century before really even movies, certainly before television, and they had a sense of still paintings uh, they had a, a, a kind of a balloting, or a nationwide balloting for their favorite um, painting. This one, and uh, Jules Breton's painting one, and which is amazing that we even, people knew enough about painting or cared enough to vote <laughs> in this country. Uh, we're a very different country now. Uh, it was also the fam favorite painting of uh, a couple of very interesting people. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, this was her favorite painting, and Bill Murray, the comedian. And there's a little story about Bill. Bill was trying to break into comedy in Chicago. Uh, and uh, the first time he got to get up on to stage at Second City to practice with the group, he freaked out and ran off and, uh, uh, and just wandered through the city. Uh, it was, his life was over. He was going to jump in Lake Michigan. You know, Bill, you, you can hear Bill tell the story. If you, if you, if you like Google Song of the Lark at some point, you'll, you know, if you scroll down for a little bit, you'll see Bill Murray, Murray and he'll talk about it. But uh, basically wandered around, didn't quite commit suicide. And then he found himself on Michigan Avenue and ended up going into the Art Institute and then end up in front of this painting. He was looking at the painting and he said, well, she didn't look. She didn't look like she has uh, a lot of uh, promising, uh, <laughs> promising uh, things in her life. But then he he just fastened on the uh, uh, on the sun coming up, and uh, he said, "Well, 
here she is. She's got another day. Maybe she'll make something of herself. And on the picture, a lot of times you, you got to really look very hard up towards the left uh, corner of it and over a little bit. You'll see, you'll see the lark that they talk about in the poem. You can just see it. It looks like a little far away uh, squiggle of black. Uh, if, you're, if your picture is not that great, you can't see it, but that's the lark. So it's Bill Murray to this day said that that painting saved his life. So maybe a poem can save your life today. So we'll, we'll start with the, uh, I'll, I'll take the picture off here. Uh, we'll start with the poem and uh, see where the poem leads us. I always do a poem in, in, at this point that will somehow um, uh, play into or enlighten our, our attempts to become um, saner, more contemplative people via, you know, some kind of contemplative practice. Well, here's the song of the lark. The song begins and the eyes are lifted, but the sickle points toward the ground. It's downward curve forgotten in the song she hears. While over the dark wood rising or falling, the sun lifts on cool air, the small body of a singing lark. The song falls, the eyes raise, the mouth opens and her bare feet on the earth have stopped. Whoever listens in this silence as she listens will also stand open, thoughtless, frightened by the joy she feels. The pathway in the field branching to a hundred more, no one has explored. What is called in her rises from the ground and is found in her body. What she is given is secret even from her. The silence is the seed in her and everything she is of everything she is and falling through her body to the ground from which she comes, it finds a hidden place to grow and rises and flowers in old wild places where the dark edge sickle cannot go. Song of the Lark. The song begins and the eyes are lifted, but the sickle points down toward the ground. It's downward curve forgotten in the song she hears while over the dark wood rising and falling, the sun lifts on cool air, the small body of a singing lark. The song falls, the eyes raise, the mouth opens and her bare feet on the earth have stopped. Whoever listens in this silence as she listens will also stand open, thoughtless, frightened by the joy she feels, the pathway in the field branching to a hundred more, no one has explored. What is called in her rises from the ground and is found in her body. What she has given is secret, even from her. The silence is the seed in her of everything she is and falling through the body to the ground from which she comes, it finds a hidden place to grow and rises and flowers in old wild places where the dark edge sickle cannot go. Now, I think it's one of uh, White's best poems. And uh, I think it's got a lot to say to us uh, about just what we came out of. You know, we, we most of us, if you're here from the beginning, we uh, um, sat in meditation for a couple of sessions. Well, what, you know, what's going on there? What's going on in this poem? Let's sort of break this poem down, uh, oh, break open the images a little bit. So the song begins and the eyes are lifted, but the sickle points towards the ground. It's downward curve forgotten in the song she hears. While over the dark wood rising or falling, the sun lifts on cool air, the small body of a singing lark. So somebody's at work in the fields, like a lot, you know, peasant life, and um, 
you know, on one level, she, she hears the song of uh, the lark, uh, and it uh, stops her. And uh, it stops her uh, work for a moment. Well, that's the essence of a retreat. That's the essence of taking time out to meditate. You know, on one level, we're, we're, we're stopping our normal, you know, to-do list. We're stopping our work. Uh, this is very interesting. All the way through the, the thing, you'll listen. There's, there's, he's playing with this. Um, it's a kind of uh, a circle of uh, uh, ecstatic experience. Ecstatic means X means out. Uh, and so the out of body kind of experience, an experience that pulls you out of yourself. And then also in end static, a word you're not used to hearing, E N static, end static, an uh, uh, experience that pulls you in deeper into the inside. And it's a kind of uh, this poem, if you really listen to it and read it out loud, it's a, it's a constant up, down, um, out, in. It's, a, it's almost like a, a sphere where you keep going, you know, outside, inside up, down, you know, the sickle points uh, down, you know, and she's raising her attention up, you know, so listen to that again, listen to it just in the first paragraph. The song begins and the eyes are lifted, but the sickle points down toward the ground, it's downward curve forgotten in the song she hears while over the dark wood rising or falling, the sun lifts on cool air, the small body of a singing lark. It's very interesting in the, uh, when you see the actual painting, it's a little bit easier than in the print, but uh, you still, it's, you can bar barely see the little lark. You can barely see the source of the song. And it's a little bit like that when you meditate, you're going in um, to be with um, uh, some uh, a transcend transcendent being. Uh, and we talk about, uh, the uh, getting quiet so you can hear the voice of something deeper and it's very hard to pick out what it is a little bit like it's very hard to find the lark in the poem but the song calls you i mean why are we even called to be here today most you know uh most people don't do this kind of thing you're you're sort of called to it so that's for starters and then the second stanza he says uh, the mouth falls the eyes raise so you see the whole thing going on now. The mouth, the song falls, the eyes raise, the mouth opens, and her bare feet on the earth have stopped. It's, which is a brilliant way of saying at some point you hear a voice that um, stops the kind of the hamster wheel we're all on, you know, day in, day out. I remember one time uh, teaching seventh graders. Seventh grade girls were like my great in, uh, great gurus for about 20 years. I taught in the junior high. Seventh grade boys, not so much. You know, seventh grade boys had a few more, a little bit more development to do, I think. But this girl wrote me a little message in her mm -hmm. reading, uh, reading journal you know, where we were passing these journals back and forth about the books they were reading. Everybody was reading different books in my class. And she was, I forget what she was reading, but so when I returned it, I said, hey, you know, you're not yourself lady lately. What's going on? And she wrote me back this little cryptic message, you know, S-O-S-D-D. And I, I didn't know what she meant, but I was a little bit alarmed by the S-O-S. I thought she was saying, you know, she was in trouble. And I, I said, well, can you decode this? And she said, same old shit, different day. <laughs> And who doesn't know that? That's the hamster wheel. We get caught in the world of work. We get caught in the world of work. And before you know it, we're in this centrifugal force. I mean, there's a kind of gravity that holds you in, into this kind of thing. There's a kind of centrifugal force there. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm 71. You know, you turn your head, you know, you're 30. You turn your head, you look this way and you're 50. And then, you know, it's like that, like that. Before you know it, you're, you're in your 70s. Where did that time go? Well, you know, you're, you're, you're in a kind of centrifugal force of do, do, do. A lot of people didn't show up today because they had something more important to do. Well, I hope they're right. But I mean, I didn't have anything more important to do than this, you see. So, and that's the key. And her feet on the earth have stopped. She's not walking to the next bit. To, she's sort of frozen or liberated in a moment. 
um, that uh, to get out of this, you know, I, I've, I've worked with a big scythe here and this kind of thing where you're out there scything wheat or whatever you're doing, uh, it's so repetitious. It is, it's kind of rhythm, but I mean, you know, then to stop it. Yeah, so you stop today. You all actually stop what you normally do on a Saturday to come here, to hear something um, transcendent, something that's very hard to hear. Uh, the monks say at the monastery, they said, uh, you're, you're practicing dying every day uh, because uh, uh, at some point you're going to graduate from this life and into the big leagues and it'd be nice to be relaxed and be ready and open for that. And so in a way, when we sit, when we sit in meditation, we're practicing dying to all the uh, superficial requirements of life. They're important. I mean, you got to pay the rent. You got to mow the lawn. <laughs> Thank God we had a, <laughs> our neighbor uh, came and mowed all of our lawn. Ron and I haven't been able to get out there because it's been like a rainforest out there, you know, with every day it rains, but, uh, and we're, we're walk, doing a walk behind mower. It's a lovely mower, but we're having to walk the whole, this guy is on a riding mower and he, uh, Morris, our, our, our neighbor, and he just mowed it all yesterday before it started raining again. <laughs> so, you know, to stop. Yeah, another another aspect of this poem, it's it's he's talking about that this this act of uh, of uh, connecting with the transcendent happens in the body. It's a very somatic poem, if you know that word. Word soma is a Greek word for this kind of body of ours, and um, this rising and falling is connected with I, what I learned from the Tibetans about doing this kind of contemplation or meditation is that you. The only way to get out of the, the mind, which is the, is the spinning hamster wheel, in case you haven't noticed this, the only way to do that is to descend through the body into the deeper level of consciousness with all the, you know, most of the, the traditions I know, which mainly the a Buddhist, the Tibetan, the Sufi, the Christian, they all call that point of deepest consciousness the heart, but you gotta go through the body. Notice her bare feet on the earth have stopped. Uh, this poem highlights one of our the things we're deprived about in, in our culture is our connection with nature. She's out. You could hear a lark. She's out under the big sky. You could see the sun. You could hear the song of a lark. And she's barefoot. There's nothing between her and the earth. Okay. The next stanza. Whoever listens in this silence... You know, you just stop. And so we're talking about the silence here of contemplation, of contemplative sitting practice. Whoever listens in this silence as she listens will also stand open, thoughtless. Interesting uh, image or frightened by the joy she feels. You know, in, uh, in the invocation I used before the sitting, I said, you know, we're once again, we're, we're, we're going down into a state where we're present, open, and available for the transcendent. It's not that, uh, you know, it's not like, have you found Jesus? Well, <laughs> Jesus hasn't gone anywhere, neither has God. It's us. We're, we're distracted. We're doing something else. So once we're, so we're finally present, open, and available for this conversation, available for this dance. And um, he's got something very interesting, you know, open, thoughtless. We left the realm of thought, just even sometimes in a meditation, it's only for a second or a nanosecond, then we're back up. There's a lot of up and down, just like in this poem in meditation, if you haven't noticed. A lot of going down for a little bit, and then all of a sudden you're back up, working on your problems of the day, you know? And so there, this poem catches that up and down nature that is just happens in, in meditation. But this line that she's frightened by the joy she feels. Uh, I was frightened by joy. Well, I didn't even know joy existed probably for the first 40 years of my life because I was, you know, I'm a one on the Enneagram. I'm a workaholic. You know, I'm going to work my way into heaven. And so uh, uh, if you know the Enneagram, that line from the one goes to the seven, which is, Sevens actually, their essence is a kind of grounded, 
a stable joy. And uh, it took me, uh, you know, 40 years and a lot of suffering to realize that there could be joy. I, you know, I wasn't just even frightened from joy. I didn't even see the possibility of joy. That's for other people or something. So frightened by the joy she feels, the pathway in the field, she's, she's frightened by the joy she feels, but also what, what she can see now that she stopped working, the pathway in the field branching to a hundred more, no one has explored. And that's a, that's a key image, you know, especially if you are stuck in a life and you know you're stuck in a life that no longer brings you joy. Uh, and uh, how do I get out of this? Where do I go? And that's, that's her situation. She's, she's actually afraid of seeing the pathway in the field branching to a hundred more no one has explored. Uh, it could actually be so frightened that we um, stay busy on the surface of life. That's a kind of anesthetic, you know. If you stay busy, you don't think about the fact that um, your, your life has moved on, but you haven't. Because this is, you know, if you look at, if you frame back out, this uh, picture has a lot of sky in it. If you frame back out into the cosmos, it's constantly, one of the, one of the things that both evolutionary thinking people and uh, physics uh, guys, quantum physics guys will say is 13 billion, 13.8 billion years ago, or roughly this whole thing started in our, at least our neck of the universe, the multiverse maybe. And uh, it has been growing and changing and expanding, but changing all along. Everything changes as Buddhist, uh, Buddhism tells us but it really everything evolves. We are evolution, you see. And so we're meant to keep moving with it. And you might have the feeling, I had this feeling at, at one time in my life, after 30 years of teaching in the classroom, that um, here I was and my, my life was elsewhere. I wasn't feeling, uh, I still love teaching. I love the kids, but uh, my, my life, it was sort of like I was in a dry riverbed. The river went that away, and I knew it. Uh, I was out of touch with the feeling of, of flow. And that's a scary feeling. And uh, it's also scary because you don't know which way to go. But his, his image here, the pathway in the field branching out to 100 more, no one has explored. Well, that's the call. Then it says, what is called in her rises from the ground and is found in her body, uh, what she is given is a secret even from her. Brilliant lines. If you look at that picture, you know, it's, it's, it's coming up from the very ground itself, which is the connection. She's, she's barefoot, she's connected. There's no rubber between her and the, to stop the literal, the electricity of the planet. But more than that, you're talking about the ground of being, you see. What, when you drop into the center, if you do centering prayer, what is that center? It's not a physical place. It's a place of meeting with uh, another word for the transcendent is the ground of being, as Paul Tillich called it, the ground from which all your being springs. And so if you look at it like that, what is called in her rises from the ground and is found in her body. Uh, one of the great trauma guys, so modern trauma guys, he says the body, his whole book on trauma and intelligence of the body, it's called The Body Knows the Score. Your body knows if you're alive or dead. You know, zombies are people who appear to be alive, but they're really dead. They're not connected to the life force you need. And I've, I've been there. Uh, but the ground that you meet in the contemplation, the ground that you meet walking barefoot outside or anywhere outside, getting out of the house. There's something that calls to you. What is called in her? It's really, you see, it's not exterior. It's an in and out thing. It's the song of the lark that stops her, but what is called in her rises from the ground and is found in her body. What she has given is secret even from her. Um, it's like, you know, try to tell somebody uh, after you do a, your contemplation, 
uh, a sitting contemplation or meditation, try to sell somebody what happened. <laughs> you know, I stopped asking people, well, how was your meditation? Because I mean, you know, <laughs> it's sort of words aren't made for it in a way, a poem maybe, poets can sort of point at it a little bit. But, uh, you know, most of the time when I get off my cushion after my sitting, uh, what happened is secret even from me, but something's happening here. Something calls you to practice. Something called you to be here today. And uh, in the two sittings this morning and the two sittings, a lot will be happening. My first meditation teacher this year to be 50 years ago, Suzuki Roshi, he said, don't think you know what's happening when you meditate. A lot is happening, most of which the old left brain didn't have access to. Yeah. So now the final, uh, the final paragraph, the silence, and, and this is key, you know, we're, we just stop, uh, we stop talking, we, we get off the internet, we get it to a little quiet place, hopefully you have a quiet place. The great uh, uh, Tibetan uh, 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 scholar and teacher, Bob Thurman, uh, he, had a, he had half of his wife's walk-in closet in his house. He was, he'd been building his house for 40 years at Woodstock himself. And he didn't have like a cool Zendo to go to like I have. And so he, he had half of his wife's walk-in closet where he put a tonka up and he had his cushion or whatever that he'd go to sit in silence because he had, you know, three, two kids running around, wife, you know, they were playing rock and roll. And so he, you, you do have to sort of find a, it's nice to find a place where you can be in silence. It's very rare to get silence. So he says, well, the silence is the seed in her of everything she is. Uh, Thomas Keating, one of, one of my favorite contemplatives, he just said, uh, uh, the absolute reality speaks every language. God speaks every language, but uh, its favorite is silence. No translation needed in the silence, you see. The silence is a seed in her of everything she is and falling through the body to the ground from which she comes, it finds a hidden place to grow and rises and flowers in old wild places where the dark edge sickle cannot grow flowers and all the wide wild places where the dark edge sickle cannot go. Now, there's a lot there. Falling through her body to the ground from which she comes. So again, that's why it's so important. And I'm gonna stress it the, the next time we have a chance to sit, if you're gonna hang with us for that. Um, at the beginning, when you try to sit, we're trying to basically leave the, the world of thought and noise, internal chatter, uh, the, the ego mind knows what it's doing, you see. You know, I think therefore I am, we bought that. And then at some deep level, we are afraid of silence. As a matter of fact, I wish I had this, but it, it came during the time I was teaching and it was in USA Today. I'd never been able to find it actually, even with Google, but they had a, a list of the top 10 phobias, things people were afraid of. And the usual ones were on there, you know, spiders, uh, you know, snakes, uh, you know, divorce, uh, death, or serious illness, et cetera. So most of the ones you would expect, but the number one thing was silence. Interesting. I don't know how they, what the question might've even been, if it was just, what are you afraid of or whatever? But silence, I mean, the ego mind doesn't like silence. I think therefore I am. So, you know, I had to, when one of my dear friends, when she first came to sit with me here, it actually worked. <laughs> she was sitting on a cushion and she fell off. She just sort of lost her balance. And uh, she, maybe she was a little bit embarrassed. I can't remember, it's been so long ago. But to me, she actually, her mind stopped for a minute. And she lost her balance because that's how we keep our balance. 
So because that's who we are, I think, therefore I am. So it's no small thing to, to just say, I'm going to lay thoughts aside for a while and I'm going to descend through the body to a quieter place where I can meet, actually meet up with the energy that knows what ought to be doing and actually can give me the energy to do it, you see? So silence, we're sort of, we're sort of phobic, although we desire it at the same time. And, and when you get a taste of it, which hopefully that's what brings you here. Um, but the ego's working overtime, frantic, because when you drop below the mind, through the body, into your depths of consciousness, it has no idea what's going on and uh, keeps trying to throw you a kind of a lifesaver. You know, grab onto this thought. I think, therefore I am. Suzuki said, isn't that nonsense? He says, I am, therefore I think. Let's get it straight. Let's get it straight. And so thinking is not who you are. It's how we maintain the illusion of who we are. And, and think of all the thoughts that drive you crazy. You would never say some of these things to even casual acquaintances that you say to yourself in there. Something wrong with you. You just don't quite measure up, do you? When are you gonna grow up? All these voices, we've never say that, even the casual acquaintance, you know, but we, we say them to ourselves over and over, tape loop after tape loop. And so when we, when we go down from there, the silence is the seed in her of everything she is. Every, the true self, if you wanna know where the true self is, it's not actually a thing like a noun. That problem with language is self is a noun. So we're looking for the true self, like you're looking for Jesus, you know. You found Jesus yet? I didn't know he was lost. You know, <laughs> the joke. You know, but the, the same thing. You're not going to find some self there because the self is not a noun. It's a, it's it's a it's a, it's the evolution of who you are. Is who you are becoming, and who you can become. So don't you know, don't be looking for something because we're out of the realm of subject object language when we go down here. That's why silence is the only thing that really works. Any kind of uh, chatter is, you know, our language is especially English, subject object. And so you can make an object out of God, we have. And then you can be an object too. It doesn't work that way when you go down out of the mind. It's only in the mind and in, in the language that we have is connected to the mind. Once you go deeper, you're, that's why silence comes in because we're out of subject object land. And if there is a meeting between uh, you and the transcendent, if you, you know, and the only question is whether you will show up. <laughs> the transcendent, it had nowhere to go. The transcendent is, it's everywhere. With, you know, center that's everywhere. The circumference is nowhere. So the transcendent isn't going anywhere. The absolutely real isn't going anywhere. It's us who finally show up and we're present, we're open and we're available for, to have this meeting. But it's not a subject object. It's not even as Buber would say, I think, uh, I thou, which is a lot better than I it, but it's I, I. You know, Meister Eckhart's probably one of the deepest contemplatives of any tradition. He said the I, with which I see God is the eye with which God sees me. To, the, 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 the rational mind, the left brain mind can't make much sense of that. But that is the experience of deep contemplation. It's a, it's a meeting of friends. It's not master and servant. Anybody with any sense of Christianity knows Jesus turned over that table on Holy Thursday night. He says, don't call me master. Don't, you're not servants, we're friends. That's why the Sufis and the Quakers, I think, hold that tradition. They call the transcendent, the friend. Quakers call each other friends. There's no, you know, this. See, so that's a very, you know, the silence is the seed in her of everything she is and falling through the body. You're not gonna get there in the mind. You cannot think your way to this relationship. You gotta understand that. Thinking is quite helpful. It gave us this, this Zoom, okay? Uh, gave us the ability to connect here on this level, but 
the thing about our meetings is we always leave the surface of things where language can operate and we go deeper. That's why we'll, we'll leave the words. And uh, so then the mind has its place and language has its place, but it's not ultimate where everything she is and falling through her body to the ground from which she comes, it finds a hidden place to grow. That's the key thing here too, is uh, when we go down, you can take everything with you. On the other hand, you know, you're, you're pushing aside your, your attraction to these words, but you can take everything down with you. You know, you had a fight with your, your wife, uh, the mortgage is due, uh, you just lost your job, your job's crazy, you wish you would quit, but you can't, you don't have the courage to do it, all these things. You can bring all the afflictive emotions that come along with the ego mind, uh, anger, jealousy, <clears throat> lonely, you know, feeling like bereft, you can bring it all down with you and just let it be there. Uh, and also when we sit subconscious things that we have no consciousness of wounds from long ago can rise up to what I call the altar of the heart. They can come up and you can just let them be there. You can take these things down or bugging you or driving you crazy and put them on the altar of the heart, at least during the time of the meditation, let them be there. But you just, you don't go obsessing about it. You just trust that there's something um, healing here. And that's the image. It finds a hidden place to grow and rises and flowers. Uh, one of the great things Merton said in his journal one time made a big impression on me. And I keep handing it back to you is he said, my rune is my fortune. Think about that. The things that the mistakes you made, the wrong thing you said at the wrong time. Um, the fiascos, um, we're, uh, you know, Pema, Pema Chodron quoting uh, Samuel Beckett, she said, fail, fail again, fail better. <laughs> you say so you're not even afraid to fail and you don't beat yourself up because you said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing. Uh, my ruin is my fortune because everything, if you can hold it in a certain way, can grow and flower uh, into something else. It's our, it's our, it's our resistance to this thing. It's our sense of wanting nobody to know about this kind of stuff. So we pack it down. It can't grow. It can't become what it's meant to be. My rune is my fortune. Write that down somewhere. <laughs> it's one of the great bits of, of, of wisdom from, from Merton. He wasn't afraid to make mistakes. You know, the abbot had a different view of Merton. <laughs> Falling in love with a nurse at 50, you know, as a Trappist monk. Well, that seems like, uh, you know, it was sort of a big mistake from a monastic point of view. Uh, but, you know, I, I hope it uh, turned out to be as fortunate for the uh, young nurse as it was for Merton because he learned a lot there. It finds a hidden place to grow and rises and flowers. Uh, now notice where it flowers in old wild places, the idea of wild here, not in the cultivated fields, the cultivated field of, you know, the ego mind, which is trying to manage everything and make all the straight rows and, you know, straighten your life out. That's not actually where growth happens in the wild places where the dark edge sickle cannot go. That image of the dark edge sickle is so powerful. There's a kind of death force in life. Uh, there's a kind of living death that can come into if you're trying to control everything, if you're trying to get rid of all the bad stuff and only have the good stuff. If you're really trying to control this whole process of living, it's a death cycle. That the idea of the sickle and the Grim Reaper comes in there for sure but also just this deathly nature of just work, work, work. One of my uh, great moments in, in life was uh, when I had a, a co-teacher, uh, her name was Carol, who um, uh, got to, uh, a sudden, she got stage four cancer diagnosis and had six months to live. And I'm not sure she even made six months, 
but uh, at that time she was she was a good friend. We had talked together for about 15 years. And, uh, and so I, I just said, you know, uh, there's a centering prayer group in town. You could go sit with them. And uh, she did. And, uh, uh, and there was a, a time when, you know, she sat with them for some months. And then at the very end of her life, she, she was in a hospital bed and her, her ground floor in her house and teachers and her centering prayer friends were come sit with her and uh, take shifts, you know. And uh, she said, uh, I know, she said, I know this will sound corny, but um, I was sort of glad I got cancer because if I hadn't got cancer, I never would have taken the time to do centering prayer. And uh, it didn't sound corny. I mean, I broke into tears when I heard that. And uh, she said, uh, your ruin was her fortune. And I don't know, you know, uh, what she graduated into, but she, she got it at the end. It was quite powerful. And so those guys in the centering prayer group, there's five or six guys maybe at that time, they held that space open for this woman to come into. Her ruin was her fortune, you see. And life works that way. If, if, you're, if you can play along with it, if somebody says, hey, you could try this and you do it, you take a chance, you see. Uh, I still remember her to this day. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, so there's a lot to there's a lot to not think about so much, but we're you know by just listening to this poem over and over again, it's sort of um, there's a communion that's happening. It's in your psyche now. Some of these images are in your psyche now, and so we're going to take up about 15 minutes where it's a uh, uh, time you could just write. It's a good time to write. Uh, just write off of everything that's happening, what's coming out of you. And then we'll, we'll, we'll take a couple dives into the silence after that. Um, and then we'll have a little more time to write, another 15 minute period to write. And then we'll come back and we'll open the floor uh, into a, a, a conversation with the group. That's what we have uh, left to go. So the Song of the Lark, David White. If you, if you somehow don't have a copy of this, if you didn't get the uh, a thing I sent out, just, just drop me a line, send, send me the poem and I'll send you the poem so you'll, you'll have it. And next time you go to Chicago, go to the Art Institute, see the painting, see the painting and sit there and just sit down on a bench right in front of it and just pay attention to it. Great experience. All right, well, I'll see you in 15 minutes, okay?